I'm Dr. Nathaniel Chin, and you're listening to Dementia Matters, a podcast about Alzheimer's disease. Dementia Matters is a production of the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Our goal is to educate listeners on the latest news in Alzheimer's disease research and caregiver strategies. Thanks for joining us. Welcome back to Dementia Matters. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Sarah Langer, a neurologist from Minnesota. At age 50, she noticed changes in her cognition or thinking ability and began struggling with work. Knowing her family's history of dementia with the condition affecting her great-grandmother, father, and two sisters, Dr. Langer started on her journey to learn what was causing these changes. She met with many experts in the field, but none would diagnose her with dementia, instead stating her changes were symptoms of other health-related issues, migraines, medications, menopause, and more. She also turned to research, hoping to learn more about what was happening by becoming a research participant at her local Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, or ADRC, but was told that the center wasn't willing to disclose results to research participants. It wasn't until she pursued her own testing with a primary care provider and neurologist that she was eventually diagnosed with Lewy body dementia, or LBD. Having navigated the challenges of clinical care and research, Dr. Langer now hopes to break down silos between care and research by encouraging the field to expand diagnoses to more than criteria and to share results back to research participants. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Langer. So happy to be here. Now, along with me is Dr. Sarah Walter, Program Administrator for the Alzheimer's Clinical Trials Consortium and the Alzheimer's Therapeutic Research Institute, known as ATRI, or ATRI, and the University of Southern California. She joins me as well to be the co-host of this series, and it's always a pleasure to have you on, Dr. Walter. Thanks, Nate. So I'm going to start with you, Dr. Sarah Langer. You are a neurologist, and so an expert in the brain. But more than that, you are an expert because you are living with the changes that happen when the brain doesn't work as it should. If you could take this time and share with us how you came to this diagnosis of Lewy body disease as the patient. Well, Nate, as you stated, I have a family history of a non-Alzheimer's dementia affecting probably four consecutive generations on my father's side of the family. My father was undiagnosed until his postmortem exam in 2008. Around the time, I was noticing significant difficulty with complex attention and visual spatial dysfunction at age 51. So I arranged for my first neuropsychological test. Although the testing disclosed subtle difficulties with attention and visual spatial tasks, the neuropsychologist attributed these findings to anxiety and inadequate sleep, possibly related to menopause. I quit my job for a year to see if my symptoms improved. They didn't. When I followed up for repeat neuropsychological testing 18 months later, the same findings were then attributed to my migraine medications and continued sleep problems. I was urged to return to work very part-time, which I was thrilled to do because I loved work. However, over the next three years, I had increasing cognitive difficulty. Despite assurances from my colleagues that they saw no decline in my work, I was convinced I was developing dementia with Lewy bodies, and I resigned at age 56. By the time I was 57 or 58, it was apparent to me that two of my three sisters were increasingly impaired by the same symptoms. I consulted a local neurologist, then two behavioral neurologists with expertise in dementia with Lewy bodies at leading academic medical centers. Both downplayed my description of my symptoms and subtle but clearly abnormal findings on neuropsychological, autonomic, FDG PET, CSF, and physical examination. The second behavioral neurologist told me he would know what my diagnosis was on autopsy. Although a very, a very attentive movement disorders specialist in California, who I sought out, diagnosed me with dementia with Lewy bodies when I was 61, circumstances arose that I had to see a new neurologist a year later. Subsequently, I consulted two more academic movement disorder specialists 
who did not feel they could make a diagnosis of D DLB and really didn't offer very much in the way of symptomatic management. So I returned two years ago to my hometown and asked a former colleague of mine to take on my care. She agreed with the diagnosis of DLB and as an expert in sleep disorders, she really listened to my history of sleep difficulties and made the diagnosis of REM behavior disorder based on my description and classic findings on polysomnography. So it's been a long journey. And without my family history to guide me, without my own neurological background, I think it would have taken me even longer to arrive at this diagnosis. Well, Sarah, thank you for sharing that story. And I imagine that was not an easy thing to put together, considering you span over a decade in telling that story, but also it's very personal. And I imagine there are a lot of road bumps and, and barriers for you. When I, when I hear you talk about this process, it's very clear that the getting the diagnosis was not easy. And it took many specialists. It took a lot of your own time and energy within the context of having this, this training and degree in neurology. What stands out most to you in this clinical process? And in this part, you feel free to take, put on the hat of the clinician, the neurologist, or that of the patient. Well, I think that my concerns about the process are that my very specific subjective cognitive complaints were not taken seriously as they did not conform to the very sketchy descriptions out there for classical hallucinations, uh, classical uh, difficulties, and that despite my demonstrated subtle but abnormal findings on various objective tests, the experts were too reliant on a very few insensitive diagnostic tests that are used to include people in their clinical research. Namely, the presence of a DAT scan to confirm dopamine deficiency, a radionuclide scan called MIBG, which becomes positive eventually in many people, but is not positive early in the course of the disease, and a number of other tests that they chose not to get or whatever because they didn't recognize that my symptoms or findings were representative of the true spectrum of the disorder. Thank you, Dr. Langer, for that. And you know, thinking now about research, uh, I'm, it's clear you spent a lot of your own time searching for information and for answers, but what was it that motivated you to enroll into clinical research? Were you hoping to receive a diagnosis or some confirmation there? The main reason that I enrolled was to find out why there is such a strong familial predisposition to this disease in my family. I've encountered many other individuals with dementia with Lou bodies in their 40s, 50s, and early 60s who also have consecutive generations of affected family members. Many like mine do not develop overt dopamine deficiency until either evident by DAT scan or evident by the presence of cogwheel rigidity or the characteristic rest tremor. They can be otherwise very Parkinsonian, but without those findings, they are not characterized as being Parkinsonian by the clinician researchers, because again, those are the criteria for inclusion into their protocols. And so these people do not receive a diagnosis. So 
that was another motivation. And finally, I'd like to say that I was hoping to have some of the tests that are done for non-Alzheimer's related dementias that are only available through participation in research. And although I found out that these research results would not be disclosed to me, I wanted the opportunity, if not to discuss those particular results, but to at least discuss my clinical course and my observations with experts in the field. It's clear that you put a lot of energy into finding research in Lewy body dementia. And what I've observed, of course, is that a lot of research is really focused on Alzheimer's disease. So as somebody living with a diagnosis of Lewy body, what would you like to see to expand our focus beyond that of Alzheimer's disease in research? The field of adult acquired neurocognitive disorders is so huge, nuanced, wonderful, that it's hard to give a concise, comprehensive answer. I believe that as our understanding of neurodegenerative processes and our diagnostic acumen improves, the proportion of people with generic Alzheimer's disease and generic vascular dementia will probably decrease. Already the coexistence of mixed pathologies among adults over 60 is gaining a lot of traction. I think compared to the past, proportionately more results with acquired progressive cognitive decline will be recognized as having a variety of other pathologies, including autoimmune diseases, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, and toxic exposures, among others. As sex-related brain differences become more well-defined, we will see more women diagnosed with frontotemporal dementia and dementia with Lewy bodies because they often present differently than men. And those diseases have classically been defined according to signs and symptoms most obvious in men. For example, in autonomic dysfunction, no woman I know has ever been asked about her ability to have an orgasm, although most men are asked about erectile dysfunction. Another example is in the field of chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Women have been underrepresented in terms of numbers suffering from CTE because although they less often box, play football, or are involved in military combat, they are disproportionately victims of domestic violence and equally susceptible to head injuries from things like epilepsy and car accidents. So I think that the field of neurodegenerative diseases depends on better understanding the variables of sex, genetics, epigenetics, environmental, and social determinants of health. And I'm looking forward to greater international collaboration and research and use of more specific tools to begin to make important distinction among these mechanisms and diseases. That is so well said, Sarah. I appreciate you saying that. And it leads into my other question, which is really, what do you think researchers and research centers like the Alzheimer's Disease Research Network, what can they do better right now for people who don't have the typical Alzheimer's disease symptoms? In order to better understand non-Alzheimer's diseases better, I think researchers need to spend more time in discussion with participants to learn their histories, which includes, of course, not just a focused list of questions, but their medical, family, social, and occupational histories in more detail. The really good diagnosticians do not simply check off boxes on a list. They think about the sensitivities and limitations, including potential biases, of the tests they administer. 
In discussing test results with participants, not only do the participants become more educated, but the researchers learn additional useful information. Our knowledge base grows as researchers discover trends not anticipated or quantitatively captured in their study designs. So Sarah, if someone came to you with some thinking problems and a desire to learn more about research, what would you advise them about the process? My advice would be to look for programs that have effective people communicating the study process. Its purpose, the timeline, its requirements, including time commitment, test risks, the opportunity to meet with clinicians, and discussion of results. Before deciding to commit, I'd make sure that I have my questions answered. And although not all research protocols will be able to share individual results, I want to make sure that the study coordinators were invested in educating the participants uh, about some conclusions of their work, even before publication. And, and so those are just some of the things that I would look for in participating in research. And despite my <laughs> difficulties, different times, with the process. I still believe that our understanding of the true nature of neurologic disease is going to come about as a result of this sharing of insights among researchers and participants. So research is trending towards a more narrowed focus on dementia, studying it in its purest form. And what do you think the impact this is having on the field and what we're able to learn from those studies? I am fully aware of this forced dichotomy between having a limited number of variables in your study design. But I worry that certain intrinsic bias, certain assumptions made um, that are part of the study design actually may lead one away from truly meaningful results. Let me give you an example. So, in many, many studies of dementia with Lewy bodies, they use the mini mental status exam or MOCA exam as their test of cognitive function. Well, in fact, if you really want to look at dementia with Lewy bodies, you would be looking pretty much exclusively at um, complex attention, visual spatial function, and later on, executive dysfunction. Executive dysfunction is not a very early finding in Lewy bodies, but it is present by the time dementia is apparent. So there's assumptions or bias there that, you know, of course, they're not going to show in a period of testing a medication for nine or 12 months that there's been a change in their mini mental status exam or MOCA because the data is lost using that tool. And so that's, that is one very crude example but I think the same can be said of inclusion and exclusion criteria that they make on individuals based on certain perceived test findings that may be insensitive or interpretations of their symptoms. 
which are again influenced by sex and socioeconomic factors. Sarah, I'd like to know how you felt being on the receiving end when a physician or clinician tells you about other suspected causes. So in your course, in this process of learning, eventually learning that you had Lewy body disease, you were told, well, it could be stress, so you should retire, or not enough stimulation, so come back to work, your medications, the migraines, the, just the menopause in general. And I'm sure as a clinician, you have said some similar things to patients looking at different possibilities. But what was it like to, to be on that receiving end as you were going through this whole thing? Well, <laughs> at its most basic level, it was very frustrating. And on the other hand, I recognized that I am among the luckiest people to have this condition because there was a certainty, uh, despite what whatever anybody else said, I knew that there was validity in my family history, having watched my grandmother and father go through this process and intimately, knowing that my father's autopsy validated what was really classic neuropsychological findings. My father, who was a radiologist with uh, an appointment in medical genetics, ordered his own PET scan, uh, FDG PET, which was read out erroneously as consistent with Alzheimer's disease. But, you know, that was back in uh, the early 2000s. And the cingulate island sign wasn't described until 2009 or 2008, 2009. So, I mean, he knew he did not have Alzheimer's disease. And that's what he was told. He knew that there was some strange genetic predisposition in our family. He left a paper trail for me. And that's exactly what I am doing for my children, their cousins, and a multitude of other families in the same position. So Sarah, I have a question about the difficulty in coming to a diagnosis when a person presents so early in the change. And so you are a perfect example of someone who, who clearly has the training, the expertise, the self-reflection, but also the family history that would make one more vigilant. But when you present it, your, as you said, your symptoms were mild, your, your cognitive testing results were mild, even the biomarkers, these fancy scans and and lumbar puncture, spinal fluid analysis that was done, everything was sort of mild. In this field where people want definitive answers, you know, how do you reconcile that the field just isn't there to, to, to be able to sort through all of these things, that there is uncertainty? How do we express that or should we express that? But how did, how did you go through that? How, knowing what you know now, what would be different for you? So this is real life. So this is real life. It is not black and white. And therefore, the clinician and patient acknowledge that, you know what, this isn't textbook. But there are real concerns here. And even though you may not fulfill research criteria in order to be enrolled in a clinical research trial, which I'm fine with, right? That there are many things that we can do to make your life optimal. And whatever is optimal for you. So personalized medicine is critical here. And so it may not be the same prescription that you write for everybody with dementia, with Lewy bodies, or Alzheimer's disease, or whatever it is. But it is addressing the nuances that are significant in that individual's life to allow them to live most prosperously. That's, that's beautiful, Sarah. Well, I want to thank you 
Dr. Sarah Langer, for, for being on this podcast. You've said so many thoughtful things here, and I, and I know that our listeners are going to appreciate that. I know all of our participants will appreciate hearing your insights and for you also sharing your story. And so thank you for doing that. And we certainly value your perspective and experience. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Dementia Matters. Follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen, or tell your smart speaker to play the Dementia Matters podcast. Please rate us on your favorite podcast app. It helps other people find our show and lets us know how we're doing. If you enjoy our show and want to support our work, consider making a gift to the Dementia Matters Fund through the UW Initiative to End Alzheimer's. All donations go towards outreach and production. Donate at the link in the description. Dementia Matters is brought to you by the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. It receives funding from private, university, state, and national sources, including a grant from the National Institutes on Aging for Alzheimer's Disease Research. This episode of Dementia Matters was produced by Amy Lambright Murphy and Kaylin Rauerdink and edited by Eli Gadbury. Our musical jingle is Cases to Rest by Blue Dot Sessions. To learn more about the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, check out our website at adrc.wisc.edu. That's adrc.wisc.edu. And follow us on Facebook and Twitter. If you have any questions or comments, email us at dimensionmatters at medicine.wisc.edu. Thanks for listening.